Welcome to today's episode of the Asset Performance Podcast. My name is Wim van Kouwenbergen and I'm happy to uh, explore together with uh, Tom Rombouts the intersection of artificial intelligence and human expertise. Welcome to this uh, podcast, Human Centric AI, the future of maintenance and reliability. So, Tom, welcome. Um, you're working at uh, iCare. Yes. What kind of company is iCare, in fact? Well, iCare is um, uh, the world leader uh, in everything which leads to asset performance. Uh, so, um, condition monitoring, uh, predictive maintenance, vibration, reliability engineering, all those are key deliverables uh, of iCare. Yes, and what is your role at iCare? Uh, I'm director of uh, data-driven solutions, hence my, uh, my appearance in this podcast, but also director for reliability engineering. So uh, I combine two hats, let's say. Okay, so we are talking today about artificial intelligence. So what are for you the major applications of AI in our field of maintenance reliability? I think um, AI, uh, however you define AI, its potential is huge in our sector. Uh, it's definitely a technology that we uh, are massively embracing and that we m should massively embrace. Um, it has different applications on different domains and it's always important to, to focus on the end goal. Uh, what is it that I want to do with it and how can I leverage this technology uh, for the better good of, of, of my economic performance uh, in, in the end. Um, and we should not inverse that, that sequence. Uh, AI is not a fancy tool that everybody wants to play with. Uh, maybe you want to play with it for exploration, but you should not play with it without a purpose. Yes. Um, okay. And the same goes for our sector. Uh, yeah. um, so, so we should targetedly uh, use this technology, use these tools to imp increase our performance. Okay, so can you give some concrete examples of how AI is being used in the field today already? Uh, yes, uh, I'll take uh, iCare as an example, um, uh, because iCare uh, handles massive amounts of data. Um, if, if, if you know iCare, most likely you know iCare from, from our wireless vibration sensors. Uh, which spit out huge amounts. Uh, every measurement is a 30k values. Uh, so one measurement alone is already a vast amount of data. Um, and, and the capabilities of the sensor to do an acquisition every 15 minutes, uh, deployed on hundreds of thousands of, of assets, it immediately explodes in data volumes. And that is exactly what uh, the first application of, of, of AI is all about. Um, AI is exceptionally well suited to handle vast amounts of data. Um, and, and that's the first application where we have used AI within iCare is to boost our efficiency. Uh, in the past, we had our vibration analyst going into the field. Uh, going to a, uh, a sensor location, a measurement location, measuring uh, the vibrations of certain equipment. All that logistical element is replaced by our IoT solution. Uh, but then comes the data. Uh, the analyst screens the data on, on his handheld device. Well, now he's no longer doing, doing that. And we have outsourced the screening of the data to AI. AI is perfectly capable of screening and differentiating between assets which need further attention versus assets where all is good. Uh, so, so those are the first applications where uh, iCare has invested in automating to a certain extent the screening of all uh, vibration sources. Yes. So, so, so that is that is the first application. Yes, of course, and uh, the same principle can go for any type of condition monitoring measurement? Uh, yes, yes, it, it, it can go. Sometimes it, it, there's additional challenges. Yeah? Uh, if you're taking a thermography image, then suddenly we're speaking about image recognition, um, which is a, another field than, than, than time series analysis, which is uh, the case for, for vibration data. So, so we have to, to observe the methods that we use 
also from a data perspective but with the core knowledge and skills that we have obtained in the last de de decades okay? um, we should never forget those competencies but we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll get to that point. yes of course because today we are talking about human centric ai so how would you define this well human centric ai the name says it already it's human centric uh, so AI and, and the application of AI should focus to, to generate value, value in our companies. Yeah, um, but we should develop AI with the human in mind, yeah, the user in mind. Um, if people don't trust the solution, they will never use the solution. Yeah, so, so we can build fancy black box models, which say, says, push the emergency button. You have to stop now. But if I don't understand, I will not trust and I will not push that button. Okay. Um, and, and that's simply said. So, so from the design already, we might reduce the performance of, of a certain solution in order to, to boost the acceptance and the adoption. Um, and and th that is one dimension of human centric. Yeah? We have to design AI solutions so that they're optimally used. That's one. Uh, secondly, we have to, to use uh, and build AI solutions so they, they optimally complement our skills that we have. And that is a second dimension which is often uh, yeah, underrated. Uh, we have to look on, on, on how can this lead to value and, and where is AI strong uh, and where are the humans stronger. Or inversely, what are the weaknesses of, of, of human beings? Uh, we are very prone to make mistakes. Um, so, so how can we use AI to, to, to counteract? And, and, and we have to, to more and more think about the strengths and the weaknesses of both AI and human intelligence. And, and, and that for me is key in, in human-centric AI. Uh, we, we have to think as uh, both equal domains which should complement each other yeah, not one as a replacement for the other um, they should coexist in an efficient and, and hybrid way yeah can you make that a little bit more concrete so can you give some examples on on how a human and ai can work closely together in our world of maintenance reliability uh, Yes, I can. Let, let, let me think about a, a nice example. Um, let's uh, let's take the, the building of a maintenance plan as an example. Uh, typically, these days, uh, organizations will use data sources that they have, being the maintenance manual of the equipment, being the knowledge that they have, um, built in certain kind of databases and, and, and so on. So, so we're talking easily about large volumes of data. Uh, what is AI very good at is screening data and then summarizing and, and so on. Sadly, what is AI also good at is hallucinating. Okay. So, so we as a human being should definitely keep oversight. We, we should be using these tools, but with a critical mindset. Uh, with, with an expert approach. Yeah. So, so in, in the domains where, where we are SME, subject matter expert, AI becomes a very powerful tool. Uh, it, it, will, it will enrich, it will reinforce our, our skills, our strengths that we have um, to obtain exponential results, let's say. Sadly, the opposite is true as well. If I don't know nothing about this equipment, if I didn't read any uh, documentation up front, if I didn't work into the topic, and I'm just blindly accepting any answer that AI would give me, in this case, uh, generative AI, uh, the results coming out of the generative AI are so overwhelming that I might accept them, even if it's plain bullshit. Yeah. And, and that is a concept that, that, that users have to understand. Uh, it, it, it's like, uh, it, it's like steroids <laughs> in, in both directions. It will, it will reinforce the capabilities of the user in either direction, the good or the bad. And, and translating that to reliability engineering, 
Um, if you are ask any question, you will receive an answer, even if the answer is ba based on, on thin air. Uh, and the answer will be so convincing that, that you as an uh, enthusiastic user of the tool uh, are adopting it. So, so that, that for me is a nice example of, of how we can use it in the positive direction uh, or it, how it might mislead us in the negative. Yes, okay. So, uh, turning it back a little bit uh, to AI as an assistant for analyzing big amounts of data, mm -hmm. um, how do you see that? How can we truly combine in that field the power of AI with human skills in order to create value? Mm -hmm. I think we have to, to, to break down the workflows that we have. Uh, we as humans do a lot of tasks very intuitively. We, we do it this way because we, we know, because we almost feel that it's the right way to do. Um, but, but before automating it, before assisting it with AI, uh, we should look into what are the different sequences of this task. Uh, taking, connecting back to vibration analysis, uh, the first sequence is evaluating, is it a good measurement or is the measurement become bad? Maybe, maybe the transmission was, was disturbed we're losing a part of the signal. Again, that requires a certain approach. The second task is evaluating or screening a good signal. That is a second task. Uh, and if my signal is good, we will do calculations upon the signal, um, leading to features. That is a third task. Each of these tasks have to be treated individually and have to be automated individually and might need different solutions. Solutions which might range from a machine learning approach uh, to just statistics. Yeah. And I, I will never opt for AI alone. For me, AI is, is, is the next layer. It's, it, it's the, next, the next step and the next level of complexity uh, that we can use. But sadly, AI is also a solution which consumes huge amounts of, 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 uh, of energy. And, and, and last week there, there was the news about Microsoft powering up uh, one of the Three Mile Island uh, plants. Again, uh, a plant where well, there, there's, there's been quite some debate with regards on reliability uh, and, and accidents. I don't have to explain <laughs> the yeah. incidents which, which happened over there. Um, but, but that's the dimension, what it's getting at now. We already have energy shortage. We already have problems with green energy and supply off. Um, so, so we're powering up a new business, which, which is very energy, energy inefficient. Yes, okay. But then of course, again, this is more degenerative AI side. Um, just having AI, algorithms, mm -hmm. monitoring, uh, working on condition monitoring data, that is something that is uh, less in energy intensive, I guess. Yes and no. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, those applications require a lot of energy. So, so uh, it, it's the same as email management. Should I send an email or pick up the phone? Yeah. Should I use AI or just Google my search, uh, um, my, my, my web search? Uh, so, so we have to be very um, uh, thoughtful on where to deploy this tool yeah. and, and translating it back to, to time series. Uh, yes, the power needed is lower. The, the volume where it's, where it's used will increase exponentially yeah. okay. uh, still. Okay. Uh, and, and even there, uh, with those solutions, uh, you have a diversity of, of approaches within the world of AI. Yeah. Uh, um, some will be a bit less powerful, but sufficient. Do we need to, 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 in, to, to triple the, the, uh, uh, the complexity of, of, of that solution, um, which also will triple or, or, or multiply the energy consumption? So, so we have to be very, very thoughtful. Yeah. Okay, so there we have a, a first value of uh, the human in, in, into the loop. Let's say making the right strategic choices, uh, uh, determining, okay, are we going to apply AI and then which, which yes. kind of algorithms. So that's a first part 
where humans still will play a major role. Okay? Yes. So are, are there in this pipeline of condition monitoring data, analyzing this data, are there other important value adding activities that human can do or of need course. to do? Of course, we need to align the tools that we use with the knowledge that we have. Yeah, uh, so us as uh, technical experts, reliability experts, we know a lot about these equipments. We know a lot about the behavior of these equipments. Uh, and we know a lot on, on yeah, the existing off-the-shelf solutions which, which do their job, which solve the issue in, 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 in a single snap. Yeah? Uh, so, so if those tools are available, use those tools. Off-the-shelf is always cheaper than custom-built. And AI is custom-built. Uh, taking back to which approach to use, I could use them all in parallel. And then we're talking about auto ML. Uh, just ask an engine, build me every model which is imaginable on this challenge and pick out the most efficient one. Well, then, then you have wasted a lot of effort. Uh, or you could say, mm, most likely that approach or, and or that approach will work. Let's build the two approaches. And, and again, evaluate the strongest. And, and, and so, so that in the data science world is, is the added value of the human. We already think upfront. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't uh, think in, in massive calculations. Uh, we, we make a strategic choice with the technical creativity that we have in the data science world. The same goes for reliability, and reliability engineering. We have background, we have knowledge, and we use that knowledge to think upfront on what is the best approach to do this task. And I approach data-driven solutions uh, as the solution which should solve challenges that we could not in the past. Yeah, so, so tackling the, the, the tougher problems, that is one approach. Or automating tasks which are time consuming uh, to do that uh, as a human, thus again increasing efficiency. Yeah. So, so, so that for me is the, the, the low level sorting approach that I, that I take. Yeah, um, it, it's uh, inspired me for another angle to look at this human centricity in AI. For you as a service provider, mm -hmm. um, how helpful is it to have a, a counterpart at the asset owner side that knows very well the process in helping to decide what kind of algorithms, etc., you are going to use in order to perform a good job at condition monitoring? It's, it's essential. We, we always have to work with experts. Yeah? Um, we work with the experts of the end user uh, who know their production process the best. Uh, we know with the expert, we collaborate with the experts, reliability engineers within iCare. They know what they do, they know their methods. And, and when deploying or adopting these data science approaches, we also have to work with experts. But those experts, they, they, have an, they should have an affinity with our world. A data scientist coming from a bank sector is a different breed than a data scientist who has grown in an engineering environment. And, and, and often that is underrated uh, because it's working with data and data equals data. Well, that's not true. Uh, you have to understand where is this data coming from? Uh, what is the data that I'm treating? Um, in, in which context are my assets operating? And so on and so on. Yes. So, so we, we as humans have to think more and more in the direction of the context. Uh, we have to think more into the direction of, of, of expertise that, that we have. Um, because AI beats us on the calculation power. So, so we should not invest and, and try to battle AI in that direction. We, we will lose. Yeah, so, so we have to think up ahead what is our added value compared to, to all these automation solutions that exist. Yes, so where do you see actually AI contributing most in reliability engineering? I referred already to the fact that AI can solve the problems that we couldn't solve in the past. Translating this to reliability engineering, we have those bad actors, the bad actors that we all know. And with all the solutions that we tried in the past, 
it hasn't been solved yet. So for me, this translates into assets where production processes are highly dynamic. And doing vibration analysis on such equipment is a tough job, although sometimes impossible. But with the power of data and the vast amount of available data, we can segment this, these uh, production states. Uh, that, that's a research project which, which we recently have done uh, in collaboration with some industrial partners. Um, so, so there we have proven that we can, we can actually solve and do a task which was impossible to do uh, with traditional methods. So, so definitely there we fully adopt AI. So that is, that is one direction where my production process is very complex. Uh, it might be that my equipment is very uh, complex. And thus the detectability of my failure becomes yeah, uh, next to impossible. Well, AI can be fine-tuned and, 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 and um, yeah, better boosted at, at this level of detection. If it knows what to look for, it can find it better. It's like finding the needle in the haystack. If you do it manually, manually it's, it's a burden. Uh, but if you have a metal detect detector, it will work better. Uh, well, in this case, AI can function as a metal detector. Uh, if it knows what to detect, it will go efficient. But you have to program it correctly to detect metal. Uh, if, if, it if it is detecting biological waste, then it's useless. Uh, the same goes for AI solutions. If, if it's built to do a certain specific task very accurately, it will outperform. Uh, but it will not have the, the broad mindset, the broad overview that a human analyst has. Uh, in pattern detection, the human analyst still outperforms the AI solutions that we have. And that's why at iCare, uh, we approach AI as augmented intelligence. We, we, we leverage the best of both, uh, the, the power of the screening of the data with the knowledge and expertise of our analysts who know quickly what to look for, where, and to confirm, uh, all supported by the right platforms and so on. So, so again, we have to, to focus on the strengths and, and not, not try to, to overcome the weaknesses. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah, your, your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, yes, it does, in fact. Huh? So um, it's all about value creating in those business cases that were not possible mm -hmm. in the past. Huh? Yeah. So uh, what, what you're explaining is thanks to AI, we can more efficiently find failures and we can do so more effectively because we, we cover more failure modes, mm -hmm. in fact. Mm -hmm. So that is creating a huge amount of added value. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. A, a typical application is hydraulics. Yeah? Uh, if you look into the range of, of condition monitoring technologies, Hydraulic applications are tough and there's plenty of failure modes which go undetected. But if you switch your mindset and look at all the, I will call them now, process measurements like flow, like pressure and such, uh, suddenly malfunctioning of this hydraulic group becomes plain obvious. Uh, but you have to continuously screen the data, you have to continuously screen the patterns and the trends that we have and see if this new trend is drifting from what we have defined as normal. Uh, so, so there again, data-driven solutions open up the condition monitoring of assets which were left aside. And, and often those are extremely critical, maybe even the bottlenecks uh, of our production. And so so uh, we as reliability professionals, we have to broaden up, we have to extend our look um, and, and that leads to, to sometimes surprisingly easy solutions. Uh, but, but they become surprisingly easy due to the technology that we now have at our disposal. Yeah, so uh, in, in your experience, are, 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 are asset owners, maintenance teams at asset owners, reliability teams, are they ready for AI? Are they, or is there still a steep learning curve ahead? That's a good question. Um, uh, I think the answer is no. Us humans, I will extend to, to, to any uh, kind of prof uh, profession, 
uh, we are always resisting to change, always. Uh, each uh, revolution in the past, each big step forward is, is, is always countered by people opposing. Uh, there's always an X percent uh, opposing to, to, to this change. Uh, and we have to properly understand and, and anticipate for this. This, this is the, the biggest change that we can encounter. Uh, so, so we have to prepare properly. That means we have to, we don't have to focus too much on the technology. The technology is there. But we have to, to look at the people, the people in our organization. Are they open to this new kind of input? Or are they very skeptical? Um, what will a computer tell me about the asset health of my equipment? Um, we have to, to look into our organizations. Are our organizations well prepared to adopt uh, this new inflow? Um, and, and also look and screen for technologies which are available, which we can use to solve these issues that we have. So, so it's always the three which should align. And sadly, people tend to, to opt for technology because technology, you can buy it on Amazon, <laughs> you click the button, next day delivery, you open the box and you have the technology in your hand. But it's a big difference between having it in your hand and having it adopted by the team who should be working with it. Uh, um, there's always this, this, this cabinet of fancy tools. Don't touch them, Don't, they cost a lot of money. Please touch them, use them, because they can create a lot of value. Here it's the same. So, so if we don't adopt it, the investment is worthless. Yeah? And, and that's a pitfall we should not be taking. Okay, so what kind of actions can organizations take in order to increase this level of adoption? The answer is quite complex, otherwise it would have been solved already. It depends on, on where is your, uh, what is your current position. Uh, where do you want to move move next? Uh, so, so there, in my perception, there's no one size fits all. But to to answer in in, in a generic uh, way, nonetheless, um, we have to make sure that we expose people more and more and more to these solutions and to the positive results, uh, so that people can understand and ideate how can it help me. Um, if if something comes flying from from the air and, and, and says this is the way to, to approach, people will be uh, will be resisting of this change. But if, if people have contributed, have shared their experience while knowing that this is not a threat for them, uh, then they might be open. So, so we have to be very cautious and, and repeat over and over and over again. It's, it's, it's like education of kids. Yeah. You have to repeat over and over and over again. Uh, that, that no, there's no boogeyman under your bed. Uh, and, and if you have done so for 10 years, then they will understand. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's the same, only we also have to unlearn uh, because, because the people in our organization, they are not kids. They are no longer as flexible and moldable. And they have to unlearn some, some habits from the past. Uh, it might be that they perceive that the capabilities of AI equals the capability of, of, of a, uh, automation controller. Well, no, that's not the case. It's way more sensitive and it works differently. It doesn't have a binary output. It has a confidence level and how to deal with that. So, so again, we, we, have to, we have to massage the people in the right direction and, and, and help them, nudge them in the right direction to go, but continuously uh, question the status quo. We don't have the luxury to sit around and wait. Uh, we, we, we have the urgency to act now. Um, and, and there's a huge advantage available for anyone on the entire globe. Um, so, so the balance might quickly shift. Yeah. So in order to kick off, um, it's educate yourself, then educate your team, your organization. And what is then the next step? Look at, at value drivers. Uh, how can you uh, earn money with this new technology? How can you become more efficient with this te new technology? How can you solve strategic problems that, that, that you see up on the horizon? So, so, so we have to think creatively um, and, and think outside of the box because tomorrow there will be new solutions which are not known today. Yeah. Uh, everybody's 
at least talking about generative AI. Most of us is using generative AI. Two years ago, it was non-existent. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, we all know in our world of reliability, uh, failure mode and effective analysis, we know uh, root cause analysis, exercises, etc. So, um, do you see an impact of uh, generative AI on, on this? Currently not. Uh, talking about generative AI, it's been trained on data, data that is available. If the data is not available, it hasn't been trained in that direction. So we have used as a, as a test case uh, generative AI on new kinds of technology. Well, first of all, uh, the failure modes of a certain technology is not widely spread on the internet. There's no OEM saying this is how my equipment will fail. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so that data is not, not available, uh, especially if it's um, equipment that is not widely spread. So, so in those cases where the data is not available on the web, let's say, by default, the outcome of the generative AI uh, answers uh, should be highly questioned. Now, if we translate that to, to this FMAKA, and an, an FMAKA uh, connects to your production process, your production process is not documented on the web, uh, it connects to the failure of the equipment in your production process, again, not documented on the web, uh, and the mitigating actions, which should be linked to the capabilities of your team, again, not documented. So is there a place for these technologies? Yes, but don't overrate them. Okay? Use them to screen the data that you have, to mine the data that you have, but don't extrapolate, only interpolate. Um, because you might get very plausible answers which are just simply untrue. And, and if, if you base your investment plan on something which looks correct, but is inversely uh, um, the opposite, um, you're decreasing your efficiency. And that's what we have to avoid. The same with root cause analysis. The problem is complex. Uh, so and, and we have to to look in a very broad sense. It, it might be that, that that my problem is linked to the context of my equipment. Yeah. That will not be available. Yeah, and anyhow, if you do a root cause analysis, there you need to first step really collect the data, yeah. and then uh, really think it through what happened, what did not happen, etc. Yeah. etc. Et yeah. So this procedure is something that um, this reasoning. Yeah. That's something that the AI is plainly not capable of today. No, AI cannot reason. Uh, um, and and uh, recently, <laughs> with the latest re uh, releases in ChatGPT, they're pushing AI into reasoning. Uh, yeah. I will answer, ask you a question, but you, first you have to think on different steps to come to a conclusion. And then, so, yeah. so, so we're, we're, we're pushing it into a method which looks like reasoning. But again, AI cannot reason. Yeah. Um, so, so that is the strength of the human. That is the strength of, of the operator. So, so we have to think on what is our added value? Uh, what is the added value of the tool? And how can the tool support me? And how can I feed the tool? Like the root cause analysis, I've collected vast amounts of data. Um, and, and I can query a search engine, which only looks in my reference uh, database. And, and that's also something we, we use in iCare. Uh, we, we have a reliability assistant uh, that we use internally uh, where we limit the assistant to only answer the questions based on our validated body of knowledge. Uh, and, and there again, you have to, 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 to wisely interpret the answer. Uh, so, so it's not something to be used uh, blindfolded, uh, never. Yeah. Because there is always the context and the change of context. Yeah. of where the problem exists. So that's that's a real clear answer. So um, reverting back a little bit then on the big data, the, 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 the AI analysis. So of course there uh, we, we see coming up more and more data, more and more data integrated mm -hmm. into the algorithms in order to detect yeah, failures or, um, or outliers. Uh, and so um, uh, the question there is, is, is 
is there a concern about the, mid, the diminishing role of the human um, so that in the end the humans will not be necessary anymore what is your view on that well first of all i hope not <laughs> but uh, honestly i think not uh, the, the role of the human st will still remain we will have a role to play in the future um, but the role will shift uh, if if your role is, is linked to, to treating volumes of data, uh, like a bit disrespectful pushing papers, uh, as we would say in the, in the 80s, uh, then, then your job will disappear, has disappeared maybe elsewhere already. Uh, so, so we have to more and more focus about the add value. Uh, we, we are better at manipulating things. We are better at at uh, the, the cognitive, certain cognitive tasks, but we're not good at, 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 at high speed. We're not good at high volume. So, so we have to think proactively, how can we use the technology which is there, which again, enriches us in our performance. Uh, so, so definitely within this and 10 years, the job market as we know it today will be radically transformed. Um, and, and we have to think up ahead so, so that we create the role that, that, that we see there in the future, the hybrid future of, of, of empowered human skills, uh, augmented human skills. And again, that's why we call AI in eye care augmented intelligence. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to, to, to look at the synergy, at the, the, the symbiotics, uh, and, and not approach it as, as a threat. Uh, because threat leads to fear and fear might lead to us being frozen in the current state and that is the least that we that we need we need to advance we need to evolve we need to to transform mm -hmm. and then we'll be uh, we'll, we'll excel if not if we freeze and and, and we completely block we'll, we'll be bankrupt mm -hmm. that's <laughs> and, uh, and that's the, the least of my ambition <laughs> yeah okay so it has been a fascinating conversation tom thank you very much any final thoughts I think we, we have covered a lot. Eh? Uh, I think my final thought, it's, it's, it's a do or die. We, we have to act now. We had to act yesterday. Um, and if not, we, we might be in for some tough times. Um, so, so we have to embrace this technology and we have to get the most out of it. Yes, and uh, ending with this, uh, Tom, I would say people that are interested in getting inspired, knowing what is possible today, well, they are welcome at the Asset Performance Conference, of course, that is uh, happening uh, very quickly now uh, in the half of November in Antwerp, Belgium. More on assetperformance.eu. And uh, of course, there is also a wealth of recorded sessions also present online. So people attending the conference have also access to that. So if you're not up to speed today, well, you can be tomorrow by attending Asset Performance. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. See you soon.